Thank you. Good morning and thank you. I apologize for speaking in, in English. Um, I am really thrilled to be in Tijuana for a number of reasons. Um, I'll, you'll hear more about it in the speech, um, but this is, um, I think, in many ways the future of uh, distributed innovation processes and um, you know, the sort of the global uh, collective of smart people getting together across borders to do extraordinary things. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some examples of that and how this global phenomena of collaboration, an international collaboration that we've seen on the web, is starting to play out in the physical world. Um, first, I just wanted to congratulate the organizers for putting together this amazing event. Um, I think it is eye-opening for the world and hopefully inspiring um, uh, for, um, for, for the citizens of Mexico, um, uh, Jose Galicat um, and uh, Alejandro Bustamante in particular, um, uh, deserve a, um, you know, just, just incredible thanks and appreciation for their ambition and their vision in putting this together, and I feel honored to be here as part of it. Um, let me start in by, uh, by the thesis, and there's only, there's only really one slide I'll give you that has, a, that has any words on it, um, but this is it. Um, this, is, this, is the, this is what I think is sort of like the message of the next decade, which is that the, the last... The, you know, the, the, the last two, 20 years, the last uh, era of technological change has been one um, where we have learned new ways of working together on the web. Um, we've learned um, new ways to collaborate, new ways to innovate, new ways to organize that cut across the traditional boundaries of countries and organizations and universities and language and affiliation and credentials. Um, I call them post-institutional social models. And that's what we've been doing over the past 20 years, is finding these new ways on the web where nothing stands in our way. I think the next 20 years, um, and possibly beyond, we'll be applying these lessons to the real world. We live in the real world. Most of the economy is the real world. This is making physical goods, selling physical goods, organizing in physical space. And we now have an opportunity to take the lessons from the last 20 years and apply them to a new way of working together in the next 20 years. Um, I, th I call this an industrial revolution. I just want to sort of remind you of how industrial revolutions work. Um, now, you know the first industrial revolution was about steam and, uh, you know, taking muscle power and replacing it with machine power. And this created factories. And the factories brought people into under one roof where the machine was and then elevated their labors from pure muscle to more head. Um, it was more their skill than it was their, 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 their physical power. And then that went from steam to electricity. And this was a, this was a, a, a way where, we, where the machines dictated the organization of our society. And we, went, and we moved from the farms to the cities because that's where the machines were. And the Industrial Revolution was one of concentration. Um, around the tools of production. Uh, the second industrial revolution was the information age. And this, one, and this one sort of manifests a very typical example where you have these, these democratization trends. We took powerful tools and put them in the hands of people. Um, the first one was, of course, the, the, um, the personal computer. And the, and, the, and the laser printer. And uh, in, in Shenny's uh, presentation, um, it was interesting to parallel uh, the evolution of Boing Boing um, as one of democratization of the tools of production. Uh, Mark Fraunfelder, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the founder, uh, first started with a zine, and a zine was a creature of the Xerox machine. The fact that anybody could print in small numbers. Now, distribution was hand and mail and tr sort of traditional methods, but there was a, there was a glimpse of something, of something powerful there. Um, then came desktop publishing and the laser printer and the personal computer, and that could be a better looking physical zine. And then came the web, and the web became a way to take those distribution tools and those, those production tools and bring the zine to a global audience. And the way you get from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions to tens of millions is simply by democratizing the tools of production. And um, my first book, The Long Tail, is really about what happens when everybody has access to these tools of production. What you get is not just 
more mass media companies, what you get is different kinds of media companies that are focused on the small and the narrow and the, and the passionate rather than mass and, uh, and mainstream. So the story of, of, of Boing Boing was really one of this sort of this second industrial revolution, the democratization of the tools of production, of prototyping, and the democratization of the tools of distribution, the web. What we're entering now, I believe, is the third industrial revolution, and this is going to possibly advance. There we are. Um, this is this is. This model now applied to physical goods. The object on the left um, there is a 3D printer. Um, a 3D printer, and I have one of those, it's called a, that's called a MakerBot, is now available for about $700. A 3D printer is like a 2D printer um, in that it takes images from a screen. Uh, remember, what, what is a 2D printer? What is a, the printer in your home, what does it do? It takes pixels from the screen and, put, and turns them into drops of ink on paper. It takes bits and turns them into atoms. A 3D printer does the same thing. It takes, it takes objects on the screen, three-dimensional objects on the screen, and then prints them out in plastic um, or, or other, other materials. And so what you get is, the, is you get a, uh, the bits of, an, of a virtual object turning into the atoms of a physical object. And um, as I say, they cost $700. Tomorrow they'll cost $300. It's, going, it's exactly like the 2D printers. And my children today um, think it's entirely normal to have a 3D printer in the home. And the idea is if you can draw it, we can make it. Now they complain about the resolution and they wish they had different colors, etc. But the idea that, that anything they can imagine they can create is completely normal to them. Now that is, now that is a, a prototyping tool. We can make one very well. Um, it's not the perfect resolution, um, and it's very good for kind of these one-offs. And it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic kind of creativity tool. Um, but and we've had that, and that's been possible for a few years. What's been harder was to make many. So it was easy to be an inventor, but it was hard to become an entrepreneur. It was easy to be a creator, but it was hard to be a manufacturer. Um, the second necessary change of an industrial re revolution was to democratize the tools of distribution. And the, the picture on the left, or on, on the right, sorry, is that of a website called um, Alibaba. Um, and Alibaba is uh, it's basically um, a portal into global manufacturing. Alibaba is focused on China, um, but there are others for, for other manufacturing centers. And what this allows you to do is, as a regular person, to go on to, go on to Alibaba and say, let's say you, you want to make a motor. You have an idea, a, a product that you've come up with. And, and your idea is that, is that you, um, you, you think you actually want to go into business. You want to create this product and sell them in the thousands. Now, you know nothing about motors, but you need a motor. So you go to Alibaba and you sort of, you sort of type in electric motor and you quickly see what motors are available, from whom, and they have this chat window, this instant messaging window that translates in real time between English and, and Chinese. And then you, and then you, you find a, a manufacturer who seems to be making these motors, and you say, you know, I need one that's this big, that has this many windings, this, this sort of voltage. Can you, you know, do you have that? And they say uh, yes, or they say no, or they say sometimes we can make it for you. And, uh, and then you very quickly d you know, discuss the, the specifications, and then they, um, then they take credit cards and PayPal, and they send you some samples. Maybe, you know, they'll say, we'll send you 100. And like three days later, this box appears on your doorstep, and there are 100 of the samples. And if they work, you say, that's great. Now I'd like 1,000. Or, or, or 10,000, or maybe just 200. And the point is this, that never before in history have you been able to get you know, manufacturing, global manufacturing, to work for you. Um, I lived in China in the 1990s, uh, from 97 through 2000, um, in, this, in this sort of, in Guangdong, in the center of the industrial base. And those days, if you wanted to get you know, global manufacturing working for you, you needed to fly to Hong Kong, you needed to be introduced to the, uh, to the factory owner. Um, there was some drinking that was involved. You probably had to go out and eat some very scary foods, maybe sing a little karaoke. Um, and, if, and after this sort of you know, long hazing ritual, of making sure that you were okay, then you could talk business. And um, you, would, uh, you, know, you would just say, well, I'd like to do this. And then eventually there would be a letter of credit and maybe some bank transfers. And maybe after six months of this, you might actually figure out, well, get a sample. 
Today, you can go online and you can click and, and, and you know, you, you can do it tonight. You can do it while you're sitting here. And, you know, by the end of the week, the samples will be waiting for you and you can order any amount you want. You don't need to be Sony to, you know, to leverage global manufacturing. You can order um, batches from 10, 100, 1,000, whatever you want. The price, the price is a little bit more, but at that scale, it really doesn't matter. So we've now done this. I can make one or I can make many. I can print locally on my 3D printer or I can print globally by uploading those same files to global manufacturing, and now, I'm in the, and now I'm in manufacturing business. And I don't even have to take receipt. They can drop ship it to the customers. I can set up a virtual um, storefront, and now I'm in the manufacturing business, making physical goods um, with no capital um, invested, no factory created. Um, the, reason I'm, the reason this is so transformative for me personally is my own family history. This is a picture of my grandfather. Uh, his, name's, uh, his name was Fred Hauser, and he was an immigrant in the United States. Uh, he was an immigrant from Switzerland, and he immigrated to Los Angeles in the 1930s. And um, he worked in Hollywood um, in those days because Hollywood was a very uh, mechanical business. He was an engineer, um, and I guess all Swiss engineers have a little bit of watchmaker in them. Um, but in those days, Hollywood was about tape loops, And, um, and gears and motors and all to move these kind of tapes around. And that's what he did by day. By night, he was an inventor. And he dreamed of, of new mechanical marvels. Now, this was California, and California is hot, and people were wanting gardens and, and lawns, and so they had these sprinkler systems. Um, but what they needed was an automated sprinkler system, so he invented the automatic sprinkler system. And so my, my grandfather's patent and, and our small fortune came from the invention of the automatic sprinkler system. And so this is him inventing or you know, doing the drawings. And then um, as, a, as a child, um, sorry, uh, this, is, this is the, uh, the first sprinkler system uh, that, he, that he came up with, uh, with the valves. And this is the patent that he uh, submitted in 1942. And... This is me as a small child. Um, I think I'm about maybe four or five. Um, and I would spend my summers in Los Angeles with him, and he would teach me how to draw, mechanical drawing. And he would teach me how to um, take ideas in my head and put them on paper. And then as I got, got older, um, this is me at 12, we would um, spend my summers in his workshop where he too had the tools of prototyping. He had a metal lathe and band saws. And, and we would start with these ideas and these drawings and these just blocks of metal. And by the end of the summer, we had an engine. And these uh, curlicues of metal you know, would, would build up around our, our feet as we would turn the blocks of metal into these beautiful mechanical marvels. And so I learned that it was possible to make amazing things. I learned that it was possible to turn ideas into physical objects. But... There was, a pro there was a limit, and the limit was this. My grandfather